Hello, everyone. Nice to, nice to be here with you. My name is Andy Gaines. I'm the executive director of Ashby Village. Ashby Village is a community-based nonprofit organization that's hosting this event. Um, our organization connects us with one another, offering support and opportunities for meaningful engagement that enable us to age with a sense of belonging and dignity. Together, we're transforming aging in our East Bay communities. So it's been uh, an amazing year, uh, last year since, since March uh, during the pandemic, um, Ashby Village actively pivoted to figure out how we could continue to support our members from a distance. And we've continued to provide a, a robust series of programs online as, many, as you all know, and we, we encourage you to continue to join us and, and to find ways that we can continue to support our members and homes through such things as delivery of groceries and medications and um, regular uh, volunteer call-ins and um, technology support, all sorts of ways. So I just wanna welcome you to, um, if you don't know about Ashby Village or you wanna hear more, please um, uh, contact us. Um, and we wanna welcome you to become a part of us as a member, a volunteer or a donor. So um, today's event, is on hearing loss and it's part of our Embracing Change series which is produced by our member support teams. Um, over the years Ashby Village has been actively attempting to make its programs and services available to people of all abilities and we're delighted that we can now offer these embedded captions to people with hearing challenges and also the the ability to raise the uh, increase the size of, of um, your text and uh, other stuff. So um, although these events are free for everyone to attend, Ashby Village relies on donations in order to bring um, programs such as this to our members and our friends. And I want to bring your attention now again to the chat box where we placed a link to a simple way you can make a donation at your leisure. Um, we thank anyone for your contributions. We'll put that link in at the end and you can of course just visit our website. We really appreciate that support. So I, now I'd like to pass it over to Roberta Pressman. Roberta was a founding, uh, founding member and volunteer. She, she was the founder of the Member Support Program, which is now one of our strong programs that provides a wide array of assistance and support to our members. Um, and Roberta will be doing introductions and share the agenda for today's presentation. So Roberta, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to our winter meeting of Embracing Change, a quarterly lecture series sponsored by the Aging Initiative of Ashby Village's Member Support Services. I'm especially happy today to announce that our Healthier Aging team has recently established a collaboration with Kaiser Permanente that will enable us in the future to bring outstanding Kaiser doctors and researchers to speak at our Embracing Change lectures. So watch for our spring lecture in April, our first collaboration with Kaiser on chronic pain management. I also want to take a moment to introduce Jeanette Ward, a North Oakland villager who has recently agreed to be a co-leader with me of the Healthier Aging Initiative. Jeanette has been instrumental in making today's presentation happen and I'm delighted to welcome her to our team and look forward to working with her as we endeavor to bring more educational lectures about healthier aging to our members. Thank, Thank you. you and Jeanette. Today's program will start with a presentation about the importance of early intervention with hearing loss, followed by a 15 minute question period, and then we'll take a short three minute break. The second half of the program will cover the types of hearing aids currently available and how to decide what is the best type for your needs. We'll then have a second opportunity for questions and then some brief closing remarks. Do remember to put your questions in the chat box. And now <clears throat> I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Meg Walhagen. We are so happy to have you join us today and have you share all your wisdom with us about hearing loss and how we can best minimize its detrimental effects on our cognitive functioning and social relationships. Dr. Walhagen is a professor of gerontological nursing and a geriatric 
nurse practitioner in the School of Nursing at the University of San Francisco. She's had a distinguished career at UCSF with major career long contributions to her profession's knowledge about healthy aging and hearing loss. Dr. Walhagen is the past chair of the Board of Trustees of the Hearing Loss Association of America, the largest national advocacy group for people with hearing loss. Her most recent work includes a four year longitudinal study of the experience of hearing loss in older adults and their partners, and a study on the benefits of integrating an easily implemented screening and educational protocol into primary care settings to promote better access to care and treatment. Among other numerous awards, she was selected as the 2019 Helen Nam Research Lecture Award recipient an award that recognizes a UCSF nursing faculty who's made an outstanding contribution to nursing science and research. Dr. Walhagen, welcome. Well, thank you so much for such a very nice uh, introduction, kind introduction. And I hope I can provide the kind of information that's really useful to everyone. I'm gonna go in and share my screen so that I can get the slides up and I'll tell you a little bit more about um, what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, and the, uh, this is, as was mentioned, it's on hearing loss and its effect on the brain, cognitive function and social relationships. And I'm just so excited to see everyone who's joined. I'm just you know, really amazed. And I hope I can address a lot of the questions that you might have about hearing loss and some of the issues that are raised in relationships and some of the reasons for why the cognitive function is one of the things that has been uh, looked at in terms of effects. So specifically, oops, I'm, let's see if this will, no, it's not, um, I'll use this. Ah, okay, I need to use the other button down at the bottom for it to go forward. But what I'm gonna be doing first is to review the prevalence of hearing loss across a lifespan briefly so that you get an understanding of the impact it has on our society in general then talk about the importance of hearing. And this is to both safety as well as our physical, psychological, and cognitive health. Then I'm gonna review some of what, why others often don't appreciate what it's like and why this complicates effective communication. Go into the importance of hearing loss on individuals, families, communities, and the healthcare system. And then really the sort of the second section is more getting at some of the technologies and other strategies that we can use to promote effective communication in various settings. And then of course the question and answer, and I'm very open to questions that you have. If I don't have the answers, I'm definitely gonna be willing to try and get that information for you. So first, before we get into hearing loss, I just wanna to touch on the idea of tinnitus. Uh, this is a subjective noise that only the person can hear. There are several other kinds, but generally speaking, it's they're rare and they have underlying causes. So the tinnitus could go away if those are treated, but it can be described in all kinds of ways. And it can be especially bothersome to individuals if it's loud. Many people can just bypass it and not worry about it. It is associated with hearing loss, but it can occur before or be a major complaint. And for any of you who might have served in the military, uh, tinnitus is the number one disability among veterans. Over 150,000 veterans were diagnosed in 2015 with this, and nearly 1.5 million are currently receiving disability benefits, according to the military.com. And I just mentioned that because it can be very disabling, and there are things that can help, but it's not really curable at this time. So people can seek assistance with that. And it's partly because of the veterans, their blast injuries and so forth that sets off the, the ringing in the ear. Um, so let's think about hearing. Uh, you, you, we take it for granted, and, but it serves a number of different functions that are so important to us. One, of course, is the first thing that comes to mind is it's really important for engagement with others, uh, just general communication. And that's one thing we'll talk a lot about. Uh, but it also serves as a very important um, source of warning, uh, he, sirens, 
most of the various kinds of uh, uh, various warning types of signals or alarms to get you up, other kinds of things like that are very high pitched. And so we'll talk a bit about why those can be missed in individuals who have hearing loss. It also connects us to environments. Uh, while I know that there are times when we wish we all could turn off the noise in the background, um, it's really important to a sense of space, a sense of where we are. Many people who get hearing aids or other kinds of devices once they've had hearing loss say, oh, I can hear the birds. Uh, they give you a sense of direction, a sense of where things are coming from. So they're very important to that sense of connectedness. Finally, of course, there's a, the idea of cognitive stimulation. Uh, we'll talk more about that just a little bit in, uh, later in the talk. And then also safe healthcare. And that's an area that's extremely important to me in terms of making sure people have access to accurate communication and can talk about their needs and preferences with their healthcare providers. The prevalence of hearing loss, it's pretty significant. If you look less than 50, it's only about eight, 9%, but then it goes up and you can see from 13.3 to over 80, some data suggested it's at least 81%. Uh, now that's a pretty significant increase. Uh, and so if you, you look at it sort of schematically, it's sort of this start, sharp the, um, increase. However, now we, that, and the, that just tells you a little bit about the impact it has on our society is that this many people have pretty significant hearing loss. The numbers do vary depending on whether it's self-report or actually tested via uh, audiometry and so forth. But this is a significant problem, especially for those of us as we get older. Um, but this may give you a false idea that, well, I don't have to worry about hearing loss until I'm 80. That's not true. When they've looked at when the onset of hearing loss occurs, it starts often very early in life in terms of changes, just like any other age changes. It isn't say that right at 65, all of a sudden everything happens. No, that's a cumulative effect of many of the changes. And that's really true of our hearing ability and a hearing acuity. You can see that men are, tend to be more effective than women, um, but it's significant for both. So it starts pretty early in life. And that helps us understand a little bit about some of the problems with hearing loss and our recognition. Because just like, again, you suddenly realize people are passing you when you're running down the street and you wondered what happened, I'm getting slower. Your hearing loss comes on often very slowly. And we adapt to that so that many times we really don't even recognize the fact that we have some hearing loss until either someone else points it out or we realize that we're not getting the information that we need from our environment. But many people are unaware of their level of hearing loss. And it's not until it's corrected that they suddenly realize what they've been missing. That's an important piece to keep in mind when you're thinking about your own hearing. The thing about hearing loss though, is it really is linked to a number of different problems. It's linked of course to loneliness because people don't go out as much because they can't hear what's going on or they feel isolated about that. It's linked to depression. It's linked to changes in your relationships as we'll talk about, it's linked to altered cognition and altered functional status and often low self-esteem. And these are really things that we can do something about as we'll talk about a bit later. Um, I keep losing the little button that lets me go forward. Um, so how do, we, oops, sorry about that. Um, how do we hear and what changes with age? I'll have to say, I am just, always amazed with the ability of ourselves to hear as we do. <clears throat> the ear is so small and the little cochlea is absolutely tiny and yet it does so much. <clears throat> and what happens with hearing is what we have, you're listening to my voice. That sound travels, moves particles in the air and it's transmitted to your ear by air conduction. Then it goes into the ear and it moves this tiny little tympanic membrane, which moves the little ossicles, the smallest bones in our body, and they start to move and vibrate. That's mechanical transmission. That 
moves, the little stapes here, moves the fluid that's inside the cochlea. That's moving it to fluid conduction. Then the hair cells that are moved in this little cochlea, they move back and forth and they stimulate the nerve that goes to the brain and that's electrical transmission. Now that sends information to the brain. The brain is where we hear, we have to interpret that. So what we talk a lot about is the changes that occur in this peripheral area, the little cochlea in the ear, but we have to also recognize that it's the brain that then ultimately needs that correct information to hear. But this whole process of air conduction to mechanical transmission to fluid conduction to electrical transmission occurs in a fraction of a second because it doesn't take long for you to hear what I'm saying and to listen to it and make sense of what that is. So I find that a remarkable thing. But what we, these are, this is just a schematic. These are the hair cells that move in that little cochlea. We have what they call outer hair cells, which are a little more involved in amplification, and then inner hair cells, which actually transmit sound to the brain. And you can see that if they get destroyed, this is just a schematic of a possible thing. This isn't what happens necessarily with age, but it's just the idea that when you get damage to those hair cells, they are so essential in terms of being able to transmit sound, you can see where that's not gonna function where, very well. But the other important thing to realize about these, the loss of um, hair cells is they're not necessarily uniform. And each of those little hair cells are sensitive to different frequencies of sound. And that, that is very important to our ability to hear and the changes that occur with age. Because what in the very beginning part of the cochlea, these hair cells are more sensitive to high frequency sounds. Think of birds. As you move forward into the base of the, the cochlea, they're more sensitive to low frequency sounds. And we see as people get older, uh, and maybe it's because of proximity, but the high frequency sensitive hair cells are the ones that seem to be more effective. That's also true of noise related hearing loss. So it's the high frequency sounds that are first to be affected as we get older generally. And this is a generalization that may not be true of everyone. Um, so what does that mean for hearing? Well, you have to realize that those are tonal relationships. And in the brain, there's actually a tonal relationship too. They correspond to specific parts of the cochlear input. So it's high frequency versus low frequency. And when you look at an audiogram, the importance of the high and low is that many, most of our vowels or a lot of our vowels tend to be low fre frequency sounds. Whereas our consonants tend to be high frequency sounds. And the, the consonants give words meaning while the vowels tend to give words audibility, which is why often when you lose those high frequency sounds, people will be honest in their statements. Then they say, I can hear you, but I can't understand you. You're mumbling. They're being truthful because they're only hearing parts of the word, not all of the word. If you look at the speech banana, well, here you see the down in the low frequency, the V, B, D, low, but more of the vowels, Whereas here, up in the high frequencies, you see the th, sh, k, ch. And those are things that often become missing in the words that we're listening to. So when you think about hearing, this is what happens often with age-related hearing. So you may have some drop in the low frequencies, but a lot more loss of the high frequency sounds. This is obviously a generalization too but in terms of where, you know, what it's gonna look like. But if you look at an audiogram of older adults, this is sort of a typical pattern that you might see. Loss of the high frequency sounds more so than the low frequency sounds. So that really is an important point in that age-related hearing loss is not like wearing earplugs. It's not just 
a decrease in sound. It is a distortion and muffling of sounds. So if you see this and you try to learn, see what it actually means, it takes some time for your brain to make sense out of this because you're missing key elements of the words. And I had an audiologist share once that if you do crossword puzzles and you fill in and you see all the vowels are there, you often cannot check, uh, guess the word, but if you see the consonants, you can. And that's kind of like making sense of, of the, um, the, the language is that those consonants really help in English language make sense of the language that we're hearing. And so it's important for others to realize that too, as to why people make mistakes or listen in and will repeat back something that's inappropriate because they're not hearing parts of the word and their brain is trying to make sense of the rest of the word. So rhyming or similar words are often very difficult to distinguish and can be misinterpreted like dime versus time, cat versus cap, all those different kinds of words that are maybe similar, <coughs> but just aren't quite what the person might have meant when they said what they said. Masks are a problem because they further muffle the sounds they filter out even more of those high frequency sounds. And you can get from three to 13 decibels of that's loudness of potential loss with masks. <clears throat> the, there are some uh, clear masks, but they're not always so easy to get. And the one on the, over here on the, my right, I think you're right too, is only one of the ones that's of FDA approved, but they still don't seal well enough now to be used in situations where persons have significant respiratory problems like COVID. They're, they're not, they can't use them in a clinical setting like that. Uh, and then there are some people who actually have recipes online as to how you can make your own clear mask. And I haven't tried that myself. Um, but it's just important to realize that this has made hearing loss more prominent and more people are aware of it even people who hear okay can have problems with masks, which is another issue. So what's the brain connection? Before I go on to a little bit more about the communication problems that occur because of misunderstandings, uh, there's a lot of interest now in the fact that it's come out that there's a relationship between hearing loss and cognitive decline and cognitive impairment. Well, why would that be true in some ways? What would, what would make the difference the ear is just like other parts of the brain. The brain is a highly interconnected, highly interrelationships, if you will, functional organ. It has to talk, one section of the brain has to talk to other sections to make sense. So the auditory cortex is linked very much to other parts of the brain. And this is just a schematic sort of, of when you see the brain, when you see the ear, it sends signals up to the auditory cortex. But then the auditory cortex is connected to and transmits information to and gets information from multiple other parts of the brain. And it's part of these other sections of the brain that often help us really make meaning of what we just heard or react to it emotionally. Um, so those connections can be really important. And there's more and more data that is suggesting that one of the problems with hearing loss is its demand on the brain. So if you think about reasons for why there's a possible link with cognition, one is of course, social isolation. You know, Social isolation or just isolation in general has itself been linked to cognitive decline and cognitive impairment. But there may be some people hypothesize that there's an underlying neurological factor that sort of helps cause a lot of these issues at the same time. The sensory losses, the vision loss, the cognitive changes, which had been called in the past the common cause hypothesis. Decreased brain stimulation, the auditory input to the brain, sort of almost like a change it or uh, use it or lose it idea, is neurons change if they're not stimulated. It's kind of like a muscle. If you don't use it, the muscle says, you know, gosh darn, you're not using me. I'm gonna go on and do something else. And they do see that some of the neurons do change when they lack sensory input. Um, that can be important in terms of thinking about adapting to hearing aids when you get them. P 
part of it is also the effort just needed to listen. If you saw that slide and you could only see parts of the word, your brain is gonna try really hard to make sense of that, but you're listening and you get tired listening. Um, so they, oops, sorry. The, um, the, the brain itself has to then come to rescue, if you will. So if I can't hear too well, I may be using other parts of the brain to help me hear, help me understand what's going on. And that's been called the cognitive load theory. So efforts needed to listen challenges the other parts of the brain and you get the, maybe a lost or distorted information that it's getting. Um, and then of course, it is true that this is not isolated. There are brain changes that might occur with age that make our processing slower can influence how we hear. So it is interactive. It's not just necessarily one way. And there's really probably no one cause for an association. And there are multiple, one has to really realize there are multiple risk factors for dementia. I worry sometimes that people get ads that say prevent hearing loss or whatever, because you need a hearing aid. That's not a reason to get the hearing aid. Maybe one thing that you wanna to do to decrease your risk, but we don't know yet if hearing loss will delay cognitive decline. Um, so, be a little leery about that. It's not necessarily like a cure-all that all of a sudden you're gonna not get dementia. We wish that were true, but that's not what we know when there's so many causes of, um, of dementia or cognitive decline aside from hearing loss. It's just that hearing loss is so common that helping it might be beneficial. And there really are many reasons to address hearing besides the fact that it may be connected to um, uh, cognitive issues. <clears throat> uh, treating it can make listening less effortful. Um, it can help relationships. It helps you stay engaged socially or in your work setting. So maybe you can continue to work if you want to and you have had difficulty. It is a risk factor for other health problems like falls or for delirium when you're in the hospital and all of a sudden you're not getting the sounds you need. So you're predisposed to delirium, which is an altered sense of, co of cognition that comes on often post-surgery or post other traumatic, or you're really very sick. Um, you can get delirious and confused. Uh, you can miss or misinterpret important information and it may, lessens one risk, may lessen one's risk for cognitive decline or delay its onset. So there are lots of reasons for, um, for dealing with your hearing loss. And let's think about the cost of misunderstanding. Uh, these are some quotes that persons have shared with me um, about what happened to them. One was a person sort of said, once you know, he asked me something and I gave him a completely incorrect answer. And then he said smilingly, well, you really should have your hearing attended to, you know. Um, this is a benign effect. It can be funny, but it can be embarrassing. But a little more significant for the individual can be situations like this, where a person mentioned we were talking about an illness to the family member, and all the time that the woman was talking, she was smiling. And I assumed that this meant the situation was improving, and it turned out it was not. So I was making an inappropriate response. I don't think it bothered anyone but me when I finally realized it. This is, can be very embarrassing for individuals. Uh, and we may not even know that we did respond inappropriately because in this case, she became aware, but we may not know that we did. Um, so it's hard on individuals in terms of um, the recognition and how they might be perceived in, in, uh, with, with relationships in, in their surroundings. Another example of that is it impacts the perceptions of others and relationships. Um, this is, we were having these conversations and he would never respond. And that really first, it took it personally. Like I thought he wasn't paying attention to me or he wasn't listening to me. And I was so offended. And then it took me a long time to catch on that he couldn't hear me. So maybe you don't realize that you miss somebody who walked by or you didn't hear them you're not being rude, but they may think that for some reason, you're just not paying any attention to them uh, because you didn't hear it. 
the other was this is a from a study that I did with persons who are really seriously ill and interactions with their uh, various care persons, uh, the, the nurses and the doctors and so forth. And this is one of the um, physicians noted that a patient can be assumed to be disoriented if not answering questions correctly, it can be very difficult to assess a patient who can't hear what you're asking them. A nurse noted prior to the board which a re erasable communication board that she'd gotten, everyone on the team thought he was demented. He wasn't. Old, sick, frail, yes, but demented, no. And another example of that was a chaplain who shared that an elderly man whom people assumed had dementia, he did not, and he felt very belittled. And it's in situations like this, which I'm really interested in learning more about, is the fact that, you know, practitioners don't always realize or attend to the fact that we have potentially have hearing loss. So we really need to have them understand. And that's one thing I'm trying to do more of is have healthcare practitioners know more about this. But it also is one reason why we really wanna try as hard as we can to maybe let them know, but also to do what we can to be able to hear as best we can. Um, it also impacts healthcare communication and readmissions. There was a study recently that looked at um, non-institutionalized individuals and they, about 11, well, close to 12% characterized their hearing difficulties as a fit, sufficiently severe that they had trouble communicating with their doctor. This is another area that I'm really worried about in that I don't want people to get information that's inappropriate when it's underpinning their care or what they're gonna go out and do. So if you hear information about your medication inappropriately, you don't wanna take it the wrong way. So you wanna make sure that you hear correctly or get the right information. Um, a, another example of this is there was a study that looked at persons who had some hearing loss and the themes there was the, that they did have breakdown. They reported having misheard a physician or a nurse in a primary care or hospital setting. Uh, that again is, can be really detrimental to your care. Um, the person, the impact on the person themselves, and this is having to self-advocate constantly, things like making sure because people had so much effort listening that it takes time for them to, to sort of be able to hear in the clinical setting. So they'll, they'll have to get really ready and they have to self-advocate because in the clinical setting, they may not hear their name called or the lab place may not do it and you get those numbers or whatever and you won't hear what's going on the person to call your name or you miss their name um, going forward being called or not hearing the number when a lab or elsewhere uh, so multiple things about the the way in which misunderstandings can be a problem or missing something so you don't hear things in healthcare settings or with relationships um, communication in general is also really important i'm turning now more to sort of relationships that we have. Um, communication is a two-way street, we know that. You have the speaker, um, you have the listener who has to interpret what the his speaker says. Um, they have to then become the speaker if you're engaging in dialogue and then you interpret it going back in the listener for um, it, in terms of this dialogue and so forth. There are multiple things that can get in the way of this communication two-way street. You can add more complica complications when you add three or four people all trying to engage in these conversations. But things like fatigue, you're not listening as attentively, or distraction, you're thinking about something else, or noise, or emotions, you're feeling stressed, these all can block communication. And if you add hearing loss on top of this, it just complicates things a lot more because it will take longer potentially to make sense of what the speaker is saying and to respond and you may misunderstand or misinterpret it and you put on top of that that you're tired or one of you or both of you are emotionally stressed or whatever it is. So we have to think about that in terms of when we get to the uh, ways in which we deal with this um, that it takes both parties to really communicate effectively. Um, and emotions that are related to this in terms of the person with the hearing loss, uh, they can become very frustrated and sad because 
they can't hear and they feel left out. Uh, and people may just respond when you've said something like, I didn't understand what you said. They say, oh, it's not important. That can be hard because you feel again, like you just missed something and you want to communicate. You want to be clear and you don't want them to discard the fact that they were going to share something with you. There can be a sense of loss um, because you don't, you decrease the amount of communication you had because it just takes time. Uh, and there's so, so the back and forth isn't as fluid as it uh, should be. Uh, so you may be at worry about losing your job or significant relationships. So these are emotions that come up feeling stigmatized, unfortunately, some people, and this is still an area that I don't believe at all should be stigmatized, just like any other health condition, but many people still feel stigmatized by the um, use of devices for their hearing loss, and the fatigue and effortfulness, so many colleagues have shared just how tired they are at the end of the day, taking so much time to try and listen and be engaged. I had a colleague during my doctoral program who uh, had some genetic loss and they expressed how after a day of, of courses and talk and dialogue, we're just exhausted. Um, so that fatigue and effortfulness of listening is a pretty important factor as well. But related to the communication partner, they also have emotions coming into this they may feel ignored, especially initially if they, don't, if they don't realize that their partner has a hearing loss. They can be frustrated relating to having to repeat and information is misunderstood or believing or assuming more is heard and understood than is actually heard or understood, which is not uncommon because our hearing, even if we have hearing loss, how we hear does vary both with our own fatigue, but also the kind of communication and the words that are used in other kinds of things. They can feel they have lost some valuable relationship because they don't communicate as easily. Um, there's an effort to remembering to use effective communication strategies that we'll talk later. So everybody's got to remember that we need to communicate effectively in order to have the communication be constructive and easy and everybody be able to understand what's going on in the conversation. And there's a tendency to minimize talking, uh, which is not constructive either, because really and truly, the person with hearing loss generally wants to stay in the dialogue. And so it's thinking again about communication strategies that will be effective, that we'll go into in a little while. On the healthcare system, there's the misunderstandings of instructions not being able to have the time to share your desires or things regarding your treatment plans, or the practitioners not having the time to do a thorough assessment or not having your name called. And the healthcare system I'm especially interested in from the standpoint of uh, not getting accurate information and the impact then it has on your care and your healthy ways of, of living and so forth. So barriers, unfortunately, to healthcare, there are many. Um, there's an underappreciation of the impact of hearing loss on health-related and psychological outcomes in the healthcare system by practitioners. Uh, there's the denial and lack of awareness on the part of both the primary care practitioner and the person with hearing loss. Primary care practitioners do not tend to assess um, hearing loss very well. Uh, in my one of my studies, when we're looking at the barriers to that, only about 20% of the practitioners addressed hearing loss during primary care visits. Uh, there were all sorts of comments throughout that, many of which may, were very discouraging in terms of the way practitioners were addressing hearing loss. There's the lack of screening uh, in primary care. There's the underutilization of hearing aids and other assistive listening device, whoops, and the, the um, cost of hearing related care, which because there's currently Unfortunately, we keep working on this lack of Medicare and other insurance coverage. Uh, we continue to work on that. And there are some plans now, some of the Medicare Advantage, but they vary a lot in what they offer. And Medicaid um, is very state specific uh, and doesn't often address adult hearing loss. So we really need a lot more work on, on the, the coverage, but we'll get into a little bit opportunities that you might use as a, um, that, that aren't necessarily using the uh, hearing aids. Um, 
there's also the fact that you have to go through right now to get an audiological exam uh, that's paid for my Medicare. The only reason they'll do it is a diagnostic thing. Um, so you have to get your primary care practitioner usually to refer you. You can sign waivers, but uh, Medicare doesn't really cover unless it's considered sort of a diagnostic procedure. But then they won't, if you find out you have hearing loss, they won't cover the, the hearing aid unless it's in a certain, uh, as I say, certain insurances. Um, so what strategies can we use? And this is where I'm gonna um, stop a little bit, but we'll move to the next section, which is what can we do to maybe treat hearing difficulty um, so we can communicate more effectively with everyone in, in, in the healthcare setting and so forth. But I'll stop there and take some questions. I think I'm probably on time for that. Yes, you're doing great. So thank you so much, Professor Wallhagen, for that great information. And thank you to the 186 attendees who have joined us already. Um, so we have a few questions. And again, there is a second part to this section. So Professor Wallhagen, if you're going to answer this in the second part, <laughs> you can just tell us right. and we'll move on. Um, so this first question is from Pamela. She says, I have a moderate hearing loss and I have well-fitted hearing aids from Kaiser. However, during the pandemic, I mostly self quarantine. And so there are days when I don't talk to anyone other than my, anyone other, anyone other than myself. Every morning when I put in my hearing aids, I ask myself, why am I doing this? When I'm home alone, all the hearing aids do for me is make my microwave and stove timer buzzers more shrill and they amplify the slippers scuffing on the floor. And the higher <laughs> pitches on my jazz radio station are more piercing than the lower range. Why do I bother? <laughs> it's an ex excellent question. That's probably one that I won't be necessarily answering in the, the subsequent one. I think part of it is to continue to stimulate your brain cells. Uh, and to, you know, obviously, maybe you don't wear them quite as frequently uh, as you might when you're out and about. Um, but for instance, if you're watching TV or they, do recommend a constant stimulation. The issue is the high frequency. I know that is an issue. Uh, you can sometimes, maybe there are times during the day when you think you're only gonna be exposed to this high frequency, it's just gonna increase the sound. Uh, you have to make sure that the, the hearing aid is both well-fitted, but also adjusted to the level that you need. Um, and so, you know, you, maybe your the amplification we, we'll get into this a little bit later in terms of how they are fitted uh, but maybe the amplification in some of the pitches are too high for what you need and so it may be wise to think about and i i don't know for sure because i don't know the total thing the problem but if you have an audiologist uh to just ask them if maybe they can look at whether the frequency is a little bit high on the there's certain parts of it. I don't know how long you've had your hearing aids. Um, I hope that answers some of your questions. Great. Um, so from Sue, she says, are there any treatments for tinnitus? What is the best medication for it? Any advice on how to cope with it? The best place for information on that, it, 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 it's a combination usually. Uh, I have a colleague in um, Portland, uh, James Henry, who works on issues around tinnitus has been doing a lot with this. And they have a combined cognitive behavioral treatment along with often sound, certain kinds of sound therapy. There's no medication that I know of that is effective. And I know that sometimes you see those ads on the internet, but there isn't right now any kind of uh, medication that corrects the, the tinnitus. But it, if it's really bothersome, it is good to see an audiologist, get a little more idea. It, like what, if it's unilateral, for sure, seeing someone, same with hearing loss, um, but talk to them to see if how bad it is and whether they would recommend some of the cognitive behavioral strategies. And also there are, as I say, some sound uh, therapy things. Sometimes if you have a hearing loss along with it, treating the hearing loss can be helpful in that that sound input can be um, useful in terms of the feedback that you're getting to 
I, I won't say eliminating the, the tinnitus because basically you are trying to adapt to it at this point. We wish we could find a way to um, totally treat it. But right now, as far as I know, I haven't seen any updates on, on things that are, are actually able to, to treat it. So it's much more of an adaptation approach that works for individuals. <clears throat> Great, so speaking of ads, um, PI, PI wrote, Question, are the tests given by sellers of hearing aids accurate and reliable or sales pitches? You mean when you when they come and they'll say they'll give you a free test? I'm not sure. It just says tests given by sellers of hearing aids. Oh, I, well, if they advertise them, I think the biggest thing is, yeah, uh, I don't want to accuse them of not having an accurate test what they do with the results, they should very carefully um, tell you what the results are. We, we will talk a little bit more about that, but there are best practices in terms of audiological uh, assessments and treatments. Uh, I'd be probably a little more leery of uh, whether they're giving the same information or they tell you that you can get this in hearing aid inexpensively and then say, gosh, that's not really the one for you. And here's one, but it's a lot more expensive. Uh, I, I, you know, you need to really ask a lot of questions. Um, I would hope, because it would be totally kind of malpractice if they did a hearing test and they gave you the wrong output from it. Um, but I think one of the things that they're trying to do is uh, when some of them are probably very legit, they want to make sure that people get screened um, but it's what they do with that information. They shouldn't be giving you uh, inappropriate. And the, I, we will talk a little bit more about that as, in the next section is the, uh, the fact that just doing an audiogram, unless they do some additional testing, is not the best way to help you fit the kind of hearing aid you need. So we will talk a little more about that. Great. Um, from our co-panelist, Roberta, are there particular changes in the ear that contribute to vertigo? That's a really good question. I think the, the problem that you have, there's less data on the age-related changes that occur in the vestibular system. Um, there are changes though. Part of the reason that uh, uh, the dizziness or vertigo is often has an underlying cause, like with Meniere's disease, or some other kinds of problems that affect the vestibular part of the inner ear. Because remember, there's the auditory part, and then there are little semicircular canals that give us a sense of where we are. And those can be disrupted uh, separately from, or in addition to, the cochlear changes that occur. They have their own little hair cells, and they're sensitive to where your head is. Uh, there's um, what they call a benign postural uh, vertigo um, that can occur, which is because there's some what they call auto, autoliths, little stones or something in the in the inner vestibular part that are misplaced, and they can really cause dizziness when you stand up. Um, Meniere's disease can, but also the hearing itself, if it's off-centered or you don't get a sense of where you are or location, can cause some um, sort of balance issue, not necessarily a sense of vertigo, but if you do have a sense of vertigo, it certainly is important to find out whether there is something going on in that vestibular system. Uh, sometimes people get Meniere's disease after an ear infection or some other kinds of problems to that uh, effect, um, but certainly if you don't know or you get it frequently, I would certainly think you needed to make sure that you get it any underlying cause that might be there. Great. So Desmond writes, Kaiser told me nothing can be done for my high frequency hearing loss that makes it impossible for me to understand speech except when one person speaks facing me. They said hearing aids wouldn't help and no exercises or other training is available. Do you have any other options or comments? Uh, without, <laughs> without knowing the, the actual audiogram, um, it's interesting that they would say there's nothing to do unless it's at such a high frequency 
Um, but if you're missing high frequency sound, or if it's a profound loss, does, did they give you any indication of why they felt that hearing aids would not be fitted to your loss to some extent? I don't see any you response didn't see yet, anything. but yeah. Uh, well, when we get into the technology, maybe there's some other things that, uh, and we can come back to this, that I might talk about that could be considered. Um, yeah. And then if it doesn't get at some of this, but it would almost be really important to just maybe talk a little more about why they feel that there's absolutely nothing that they can do, what the level of um, impairment is. Uh, and maybe they just mean that there's really a lot of what might be considered dead spaces, that, that there's really nothing to, I, I'm gonna say nothing to work with at a certain part of the cochlear cochlea, but there may be other things that depending on your health, your needs, what, you know, those kinds of things in terms of communication. And is this in both? Well, you, you don't have the interactive <laughs> thing. It would a little bit depend on whether it's both ears as well as to whether you could get um, something like a, what they call a bicross or something where it takes the hearing from one sound, the sound from one side and transmits it to the other ear, which may function a little bit better than the one that um, that's having the most difficulty or has the most trauma to it. It's bilateral that changes that a little bit. And that leads us really well in, I'm gonna combine two questions that came in. So one from Maria was asking, is it possible to have a different hearing loss type in my two ears? And then Cynthia wrote, I have one-sided hearing loss. Any recent advances that might help me hear better? Well, with a one-sided and with the um, two different, you, you, you can, uh, I mean, anything's possible with hearing loss. It probably means if one could be more, for instance, if you're exposed to a loud noise on one side, you can get unilateral hearing loss or one that's more traumatized than the other. Uh, sports persons who use guns and so forth who have it and they shoot with one side and uh, that traumatizes the, the cochlea on one side more than the other, or you're exposed to a loud blast all of a sudden on one side. Um, so yes, it certainly could be possible that you'd have two different um, hearing losses on the two different sides. If they're significantly unbalanced though. I mean, that is something that people should be aware of. I mean, it's, it's unilateral hearing loss is uh, sort of a, a initially a problem in terms of making sure that there's nothing like an acoustic neuroma or something that's causing a problem on one side. So they, you wanna get it evaluated if it's really a significant non-bilateral because usually hearing loss with age is more symmetrical and bilateral. Uh, that's not always true. But again, it's, it's wise to, to know that if you really have loss unless it comes on suddenly because of a blast or something like that. Um, but they, the thing that I was saying for unilateral there is the um, bicross, what they call a bicross or a, he a hearing device that can be fitted that sends signals from the one ear that's not hearing too well to the one that has a hearing aid and that can hear better. Um, that is possible one solution, but it, it depends a little bit on the hearing loss in the one side, the unilateral one. And how long, how long you've had it and when it came on, if it comes on fairly suddenly for sure, trying to make sure you get it assessed to see if there's not something that's going on in that particular ear. Mm -hmm. Great. So Jennifer writes, are you familiar with an experimental treatment FX-322 for sensorial hearing loss? Well, the number doesn't sound familiar. I know there's a lot of work being done on medications and other approaches to regenerating the hair cells. There isn't, and so there are ads for studies for those, uh, but I, that number doesn't, I can't say that I've, I've heard that particular, I'd have to look it up and get the actual thing to see what, what it was. And if, it, if it's related to a study, it may be people looking at regenerating hair cells. There's a strong interest for sure 
uh, but as I say, it hasn't been successful. And partly based on the fact that things like um, birds can regenerate their hearing and we keep wondering why can't we, uh, but they haven't come to a successful conclusion yet. Alice writes, can you talk about hearing loss from Meniere's disease? How prominent is that? It can be pretty prominent. I mean, again, that's Meniere's disease is an illness of the, um, of the inner ear. And they usually give you some medication for it to try and uh, stabilize it. Again, whether you, it goes away totally. Uh, some people have episodes sort of of the difficulty hearing, but you, they do treat the hearing loss that can sometimes accompany it uh, with hearing aids like they do other hearing devices. And that can help some, but uh, it's often the vertigo that can be also quite disturbing to people. Right. Okay. Alice writes, since the ear is partly bone, is there a connection between osteoporosis and hearing loss? There is, um, well, the, the bones can be affected, yes. Uh, but the, I, I don't think there's a, I've not read about any direct cause of saying osteoporosis porosis can cause hearing loss. Uh, it certainly could be associated with it in terms of just the changes in the bone in terms of it. But you can also get um, bone growth in the inner ear, the middle ear more than anything, autosclerosis, that can affect your hearing, but it's more of a conductive loss than a sensory neural loss. Right, and Desmond replied, they're gonna look for the audiogram <laughs> during the break and try to get that to you. Um, okay, well, I, I'm, not I'm not an audiologist, <laughs> so I'm not gonna necessarily diagnose it, but I'd be interested in uh, how bad the, the high pitch is. So I'm gonna combine these two questions. One is from Mary and one is from Susan. So Mary writes, I'm very aware of people speaking so quickly, I can't follow, especially younger people. Is this related to hearing loss? And then Susan writes, I have four very small grandchildren. When we get together for family dinners, the din of the little ones almost completely interferes with my ability to hear dinner table conversation among the adults. I have reasonably good hearing aids that work pretty well in most other settings. Not sure what can be done. Well, let's talk about that a little bit more in the next section. Great. Um, that is a problem. And part of the reason, again, for the children is that their voices tend to be high pitched. So it's not an uncommon complaint that I can't hear my grandchildren or they're, you know, they talk too fast or whatever. And I would think that the issue of talking fast is a, it's probably two factorial. One is many times, if you look at the speed by which most of us talk, it's really too fast anyway. Um, if it's got any kind of accent, people have a lot more trouble hearing accents uh, than they do uh, their own language. Um, but it's true that because if you have hearing loss, you're really trying harder to make sense of the words. It, it may be, and there, sometimes it, it can be slowed through the, through the auditory processing uh, section, but um, it may also be that you're just trying really hard to make sense of what's going on. Because as I will say later, hearing aids are not a total solution by any means. And we, there are other things that you should probably use with them. Great, so, okay. I think maybe this would be time to take a, a break. Great, I was gonna have one more question, but we can take a break now. Okay, <laughs> no, you can. Okay, we'll do one more. And then yes, I was going to uh, remind everyone we are going to have a second question and answer piece at the end after Professor Walhagen does her second portion. So the last question is from Celeste. Does hearing loss make you more sensitive to loud noises such as loud traffic or construction noise? It can. There's, a, there's an idea of um, recruitment and part of it is the issue of the loudness of the construction noise and what they call the sort of a, a range of, of comfort between the high amount that they have and the level. We all get pain from some of those loud noises uh, if it's loud enough. But often for persons with hearing loss, the level, the loudness, if you will, the decibels at which you can actually hear something 
and the level of loud, uh, painful types of input is narrower. So it, it, and of course, if you have hearing aids, unfortunately, sometimes the amplification there can make it worse. That's one time when you have to be very careful, uh, but it's not uncommon for persons to feel like they're uh, sensitive to noise. And you know, people can have sort of a hyperacusis, but um, that's not, wouldn't say that was super uncommon to have that kind of experience. And as I say, it may be partly related to how high the noise needs to be for you to hear it and then the level at which you uh, have discomfort. Great, so Roberta, do you wanna lead us into a, a little break before the second piece? Sure, uh, why don't we all take a little break of about three minutes to stretch or get a drink and then we'll come back and focus more on the various types of hearing aids um, that might be useful for different situations. Right, and for all of those who are here and resettling in, I'm going to put our um, YouTube channel link again in the chat. It's also available off of our main website. I know there's a ton of information that is being shared and you might wanna review it later. So I'll hopefully have that recording up by the end of the day. And that's our YouTube channel. If you wanna to subscribe to it, then you'll be alerted whenever a new video is posted. Okay, I think we can resume. Um, if, um, Meg, are you are you ready to to come back? <laughs> she may need another minute. I'm assuming we haven't lost her. Is that right, Sivian? Uh, no, I show her it's still on. Okay. There you go. I think Maggie might be muted. Let me. Um, yeah, I'm muted. There you go. 
I don't know if everybody else is muted at the same time, but I hope this is the information. A lot of good questions, but um, they are pretty technical at times and they want answers to their <laughs> intervention, which I understand. Okay, so I think we're ready, Roberta. I think we're good. Take it away, Meg, whenever you're ready. Okay. Well, I hope that um, so far some of the questions uh, will be maybe addressed a little bit more in this section, but um, if not, I'll have to see if I can come back and get some information for certain people if I, I can't answer those questions totally. But there are things that can help. Um, there's technology and we're going to talk about assisted listening devices. When people first think about assistive listening devices, obviously they think about hearing aids and hearing aids, they keep improving. So this is just a sort of schematic of the range of things that you can get. There's the completely in the canal, um, there's over the ear, there's in the canal, there's the sort of what they call a half shell. Um, and then there's, you know, a lot of the ones that are used now are the behind the ears, but they have the, what they call a receiver in the canal. It's where the sound is um, is both is provided or inputs and so forth. But the thing about hearing aids is so many individuals really want to have the really small versions. And when you see someone or you're getting your hearing um, assessed and you want to deal with your hearing loss, you really need to approach it from the standpoint of um, the, what your hearing loss is. And it can be from what's considered relatively mild um, up to very severe or even profound. And these little folks have so many things in terms of, one, if you have any dexterity problems, these are really small. And on, the only thing that is out of your ear is that little wire. Uh, and so the batteries, if we're talking about batteries, which have to be replaced, are also very, very small. Um, so you want to think about hearing aids in relationship to your hearing needs. Don't think size. Think what you need to correct your hearing. Um, and so many of the hearing aids now are so small anyway. They, they're behind the ear, but they are, uh, which can have more programs and more functionality, uh, but they also can, um, they're, they're, they're really almost invisible. And I don't think visibility should be a reason for buying a hearing aid. I think the function should be the reason for buying a hearing aid. But you need to talk to the practitioner. There's so many different companies now and they all have very similar kinds of hearing aids, come with different programs, but you need to think about the, the needs of your hearing. Um, and these, as they say, the ones that are so small, you've got to think about the battery that's going in them and, and whether um, that's going to be, that's going to work for you. Uh, a hearing aid is expensive or can be. Uh, this was some of the latest price range I looked at, uh, but it depends. That's why you need to shop around. You're often now still not paying necessarily for the hearing aid, but it's a bundled service, which means that you, it should come with the follow-up adjustments, uh, number of returns, all the things that you have. So use it, know what the benefit is. You also don't always need the most expensive version. They keep adding programs and upgrades. So last year's model may be great and you may not need all the bells and whistles that are included in the hearing aid itself. Um, the effort to unbundle services is, is now going on to try and promote transparency but you really have to ask questions and shop around because they've done studies even locally where the same hearing aid has a different price depending on where you go. Uh, so there's a, a program a hearing tracker which is online that can provide, that does try to get um, information on audiological uh, places to go, various services and so forth. And they 
I won't say they, they don't vet them per se, but they have them answer specific questions. So you can go on there and look at, for audiologists in a specific area and try to get a better sense of what they offer. Um, but the big thing is for you to be an informed consumer from the standpoint of making sure you ask what comes with the service, what are you getting with the cost is, do you really need it? Tell the person what kind of hearing loss you have, where you have the most difficulty, because it, it may be when you're out somewhere, you can say, what do I need for this particular um, setting or situation? Where do I need to hear most or best? And they can then begin to think about the different kinds of programs. The programs that come with hearing aids now can vary a great deal. You can have a program um, that uh, tries to aim the sound that you're getting more from the front. So it blocks out some of the background noise. Uh, there are hearing aids for uh, mun musicians because sometimes the tones that you need for if you're really into music and playing a lot, what you need would be very different. So tell the audiologist what you need to have corrected and try to make sure that they are assessing all those, all those pieces. The other thing is when you saw that audiogram, one of the things about the audiogram, <clears throat> if, if it's just the audiogram that, it's, that you are listening to pure tones at different frequencies. What they then might give you is what to call a pure tone average. And that's where they take three frequencies that depending on whether they do high frequency loss or lower frequency or more what regular mid here uh, frequencies. And they average those three together. Well, that's not really helping to address your hearing in the real setting. So most audiologists, when they do a complete exam, test the level of your understanding of words and they will test your hearing in what they call background noise. Um, so that they'll, you'll be listening to the frequencies but they'll have some kind of background, what they call babble or some other kinds of things going on which is more realistic to what we have in the settings. As many people will share, and many of you said, when you're in a single room with one-to-one -one communication, that's often the best place to hear. But most of us don't function that way when we're out and so forth. There's always people around and there's background noise. It may be just general environmental noise. Um, so you need to think about having your hearing tested as realistically as possible and have them share with you how you do in these various areas in terms of speech understanding. And then they can help, or they should be able to help um, identify what kind of program or what kind of hearing aid might work best for you. And we will talk also the fact that hearing aids don't solve these problems. Um, you also have to think about the cost of batteries because batteries come in various sizes but the um, cost of these can prices from 60 can range from approximately $15 to 30. Uh, and you need to, they, they wear through fast if you're using them a lot um, or you use the Bluetooth factor on a hearing aid because there are functionalities that they'll stream to your cell phone or whatever. Um, those kind of eat batteries. They're, they can be quite um, problematic that way. There are some rechargeable hearing aids now but my understanding from what I've been uh, told is that the um, cost of those are not much different than the batteries currently because you then have to change the rechargeable battery at a certain time. So it sort of evens out a little bit. And I haven't done that comparison per se, but you have to think about, well, am I really saving money? It may be convenience, but uh, am I really saving money if that's my uh, is that if that's what I want to do. Um, to change the batteries, you just need to know a couple of things in terms of how to uh, open the door, take the battery out, remove the protective cover on the new battery, and then put it in. But one thing that is often not shared um, that I learned from an audiology relatively recently is the fact that you shouldn't close the door right away. Wait for a couple of minutes. They even say maybe more, but at least a couple of minutes before closing the door because that 
saves battery life. And as most of you who um, have hearing aids, I'm sure it had been told, when you take them out at night, you have to open the door because that protects the, um, the battery power as well. It still depletes itself. Once you pull off that protective covering, it starts depleting itself. So it's not a total um, stopping of that, but it decreases the amount of um, uh, loss over time. So it protects the battery a little bit. Um, hearing aids are aids. Uh, what they are basically simply there's a microphone, an amplifier, and a speaker uh, or a receiver, as they call it. Uh, and the, what's different about the modern ones or the more recent is what hearing aids can do is they make speech easier. They don't restore normal hearing. We can't fix those underlying little hair cells at this point. But the audiologist should be able to filter the sound to fit your hearing loss. And that's what I was talking about and way, where the amplification is, is that they, when they do the audiogram, they can see that maybe your low pitch level is pretty good and they don't amplify as much there as they do in those areas where the, um, where the high frequencies are lost. And I, I think what's, what's hard about doing this in some ways is that even with the high frequencies, you may have some hair cells that are more functional than others. It may not be a uniform loss or there may be a section where it's what they call sort of a dead area or it doesn't really transmit much at all. It is true that it's much harder to try and correct that from the standpoint of using the hair cells to correct um, the deficit. So they do the best they can in terms of various strategies. Sometimes they compress where you hear and you have to get used to a slightly different sound, but they try to use the most functional hair cells that you have. So there are different strategies. They're always testing these things in terms of what will work best. <clears throat> and, but always the idea that they try to make sure as much as possible when you see them playing around with the dials and where the hearing loss is and where the frequencies are. And then they should test the hearing aid, what they call real-time measure, real measurements, is that they should test what you actually hear. Uh, and so you always want to ask and make sure that they're doing that so that they, you, they are assessing what you hear with the aid they're recommending in terms of the frequency it is. So that's something that the, the audiologist should be doing if you get fitted for a hearing aid. Um, the hearing aid, you're also hearing aid compatible phones uh, and they come with various kinds of uh, rating systems. I think most phones probably are now much more inclined to use all these systems because um, it's, you know, they, they want to sell cell phones. But there's a microphone mode in what they call a telequil. And I'll talk about that a little bit um, very shortly. But they want um, what they call an M and a T ratings are better. So the higher those M's and T's are, the better they are in terms of the uh, usefulness of the cell phone. Um, so that they say the, the mode, they say at least an M3 for uh, both modes in terms of the, the uh, rating scale that should be have. And the regulations now allow you to test the device before purchasing. So if you have a cell phone or if you have a hearing aid, make sure if you buy a hear a uh, cell phone that it is both compatible but you can test it to make sure it works pretty well with your particular hearing aid. <clears throat> um, don't lose a hearing aid when wearing mask. <laughs> this is something that's come up that because people are wearing masks uh, they take off the mask from the little behind the ear and it just flips the hearing aid off and many people are saying that they've actually lost hearing aids or it just flips out. Uh, so there are various things that you can do um, to uh, make it less likely. One is, of course, get masks that have the behind the head ties. Uh, there are clips like the one down here that clips it to your glasses. Um, and then there are straps with buttons to tie the mask behind your head. I actually made one of these myself, uh, which just took a couple buttons and a little piece of material and so the buttons on the ends. And so that's really, a, that is, ha happens to be an easy home fix if you don't wanna 
buy one, but there are various kinds. They're fancy ones, they're ones that look like butterflies. So you can get something to hook the mask behind your head so it's not right behind your ears. That also can be very nice for persons who wear glasses, mainly because the, um, any of these strategies, because you're, if you have glasses, maybe sort of sunglasses, and then all of a sudden you're trying to put this mask on and you have your hearing aid, you've got a lot of stuff behind your ear and your ear doesn't hold all that, which makes it more likely to, to fall out. You don't wanna lose one of these things. So um, there are I think, ways to try and deal with wearing a mask. Um, I also just want to mention, because hearing aids are one thing, and but more and more persons are getting cochlear implants. These are very different than hearing aids. Um, for a while, it was more if you had a, really a profound uh, hearing loss, they're getting a little more uh, flexible on who gets them. And they certainly are putting them in persons at uh, higher and higher ages. The thing about the cochlear implant is the external piece looks like a, right now, a large hearing aid. It probably will get smaller. And I think there are some that are um, work a little differently that don't have that particular external thing. But, um, but what you have is an external part that acts like a hearing aid that transmits to something that sends signal across to an internal receiver. And this is a magnificate, uh, mag magnet kind of approach. So you take it off at night or something, you're taking the man magnet and pulling the two devices apart um, and then put it on and the magnet hooks up again to the receiver inside the ear. And then they take and they put a very tiny electrode. I'm amazed they can do this because the cochlea is so small, but they feed this tiny little electrode into the cochlea. And that electrode stimulates the nerve you're not using the hair cells anymore. In fact, uh, putting that wire in will disrupt the hair cells that it passes. They're making them shorter now so that maybe um, not all the hair cells in the cochlea are necessarily um, affected, but it's those electrodes that directly stimulate the nerve. And then the nerve sends the signal to the brain. The thing about cochlear implant is it's a different sound. It's a digital sound. They're getting much better with a lot of these uh, electrodes that are much more refined, but it is a different sound. And so one has to relearn how to listen to the sound and make sense of it. Um, as I say, some people do really well, really fast. Others take a while. They don't um, usually turn these on right away. In other words, they'll put them in and it's a short, a relatively short surgery. They'll put them in and then they won't turn them on for a while. And then they'll turn them on and they'll fit it more to your hearing loss. Um, and then you need to practice in terms of uh, listening to words, listening to sentences, getting used to that sound. These are very, very common in children now. Uh, and I would imagine, and this is, I haven't seen the study, um, that children do much better because they're not used to listening the way we do in terms of uh, using hair cells if they've born with more hearing loss. But um, I can't swear by that, but um, their brains are probably a little more adaptable. We've been so used to using our hair cells and hearing that kind of sound that making sense of this more electrode kind of sound is uh, it's a bit more difficult for some people. But you need to be evaluated carefully. Now, interesting enough, um, sadly, I guess, is cochlear implants will be covered by Medicare uh, because it's a surgery. Uh, and it's a, as I, yeah, it, it's a surgical procedure. So it falls under a different category than um, hearing aids. Hearing aids, when the Medicare bill came in in 1965, wasn't designed to do what it does now. So there's a whole section that it calls an exclusionary criteria that basically says that Medicare will not pay for routine eye care, dental care, or hearing aid care, or hearing care. So those are things we're still working on because they're so critical um, life satisfaction and quality of life issues for most of us as we get older. But 
But I wanted you to be aware of this because if you have a really significant one, a hearing loss, and it's something maybe to talk with your audiologist about and say that, you know, do you feel that maybe I'm a candidate for a cochlear implant? Um, obviously, it's, it's not good for anyone who has any kind of cognitive kinds of issues if they have difficulty possibly learning how to use these, but they are putting them in in many, many individuals and they're quite successful for, um, for those who use them um, in most cases. Uh, but the, um, I was gonna just say that it's to say besides the practice that you wanna put in on them um, and getting used to the, the, uh, the sound and so forth, um, you want to be sure that, you know, it's usually one, one ear at a time if you are ending up with one. So uh, be sure you get good advice in terms of whether it will work for you or could be an option for you. Alter there are also alternatives to hearing aids. Um, there are a lot of what they call personal sound amplifiers. Uh, some of these are not good at all. You have to be very careful but these are not advertised as hearing aids. Uh, so they're not advertised for hearing loss. Uh, you have to watch the sound output so they're not too loud because some of these don't limit the um, amplification. They're designed more, I mean, they're not designed for hearing loss. And in fact, if they were advertised as for hearing loss, they'd have to go through uh, strict regulations, um, but they, can sometimes work for persons with mild to moderate hearing loss. And some of the newer ones with all the new technologies have been found to be quite useful for persons. Um, the Bose Herophones, uh, I have someone who has hearing loss who really loves these. Uh, persons who have very mild hearing loss may benefit from some of these, uh, but there's something that you just need to really think carefully about in terms of not buying something um, that is sort of, they advertise in many of these magazines about hear perfectly or whatever. Uh, they usually advertise them as being available for uh, persons that are going out like hunting or something else like that. So they try to make them sound like they're not advertising for hearing aids. But the other piece to this is besides these ones, some of these have been tested with regular hearing aids and they turn out to have pretty good uh, results. Um, so it's not something to necessarily discount for persons who are maybe just new to hearing aids. And along with this, and these will probably begin to fall into that category, is over-the-counter hearing aids are coming. These will be regulated. Um, more than three years ago now, there was a bill um, that was passed that mandated uh, for the FDA to come out with these over-the-counter hearing aids. And they went through, they had the three years window to sort of design what it would be like, what standards you needed, uh, what criteria were involved uh, without making them uh, necessarily go through the same thing that a hearing aid would be because the idea was to have these less expensive. These are only for mild to moderate hearing loss, uh, probably more toward the mild, milder side. We don't know what they're gonna look like because they haven't come out totally. But in some cases, if it's like on a, uh, like for the Bose or whatever, it may be something that will take some manipulation or some technology to um, be able to adapt to them. So you have to be able to sort of use those. And we're trying to think about the best advertising and the best information that because we, we really want the, uh, the purchaser, the consumer to be well informed about what they're buying and what goes into those. Um, and we do, they're not to be used by children for any, not, nothing under 18. Uh, but unfortunately, do, they blamed it on the pandemic, but they got slowed down. So they have not come out with something yet. So we're still waiting. But the idea was this could open the opportunity to more people who will not go to see an audiologist or will not wear a hearing aid. And this makes it easier for them to try them. But, and you can get these and still go to an audiologist, get your hearing um, assessed, but not buy their hearing aids. 
So that comes with regulations around um, audiological practices and audiologists are adapting to many of these in terms of looking at the opportunities for them as well. And we are hoping that they will do more audiological rehabilitation um, when they're not necessarily um, selling hearing aids. Because when you have a hearing aid, I'll talk a little bit more about this too, uh, you want to be taught how to use them effectively, where they're good for you, where they're not good for you, how to learn better speech things, because hearing aids don't solve the problem. Um, and there are a lot of other assistive listening devices that you can use with hearing aids, often very um, needed actually, and or in like large systems. I mentioned early on that we uh, lose uh, alarm systems often. We don't hear them because they're high pitched. There are special kind of alarm systems you can put in your home that are made for persons who have hearing loss that are different frequencies or that flash lights or other kinds of things that will work for you so that you, you're, you're warned about, or they tell you that someone's at the door. Um, for bigger settings, there are different kinds of listening devices that um, use different strategies than hearing aids per se, uh, but they amplify sound in large settings. There's, if you're just trying to listen, if you have someone who really is not interested in, in wearing hearing aids, but they need something for things like TVs where they don't wanna have everybody else have to leave the room because they turn up the sound so loud. There are TV listening systems that are affected. There are more and more things that are coming out that help us with, um, with hearing, but there are also devices that are very specific to a hearing aid right now. It's what we call interoperability is not there. In other words, if I buy a certain manufacturer's hearing aid, I can't go to a different manufacturer and buy an assistive device that fits with my hearing aid. It would have to be by the same manufacturer. Uh, we're trying to deal, make sure that they can be used across systems, but that hasn't come to fruition yet. So there are systems that will be, for instance, you have a hearing aid and you get a stream system that you can put in the middle of a table and then people around, that picks up the sound of the people around and it goes directly to your hearing aid. Um, so you can talk to the audiologist about what's available with the make of hearing aid you have that might help you either hear the phone better, hear out in a restaurant better by putting this device in the middle of the table, um, or that you can have uh, things like little wands that are available that will be almost like little microphones that go to your hearing aid. So these are different kinds of things that help because hearing aids are really only beneficial within about six feet uh, and usually on sort of more one-on-one. -on -one. When you get into an, a, a, a difficult acoustical system or something that's echoey or with a lot of background, they're just not as effective, they can't be. Um, so having these other devices along with them can be better you can get amplified phones. And then personal amplifiers, if you're not ready to get a hearing aid, or maybe you're in a situation where you wanna have um, uh, put the amplifier where it sits in the middle of a table or something, these personal amplifier, we talk, uh, they're really great for clinical settings when people don't have hearing aids, but they're, they're little amplifiers and uh, you wear the headphones or earbuds and then the person talks into the little amplifier and it cuts out background noise. They can be quite effective. Uh, you do have to be a little careful about not starting too high with the amplification. Make sure you start low and increase into the level you need, but they're certainly a lot less expensive. Um, these can become I mean, relatively inexpensive ones, but these can be around 150 to 250 or so dollars. Some of them come with uh, T coils, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so they can be very effective for persons who are maybe not um, have dexterity issues or only want to listen in certain places or need for that single thing in the middle of a table or something else that can work. Uh, and of course you can use them when talking to partners and so forth too. Uh, and then there's the captioned phones. This is something that people don't often know about. If you have a significant hearing loss 
and you can't hear on the phone well, you may be eligible for, this is a free system, um, captioned phones. And they, they give you the phone. This can also be on now a computer or your cell phones or other kinds of things. It doesn't have to be a cell, but they give you the phone. And when you call, there's an actual transcriptionist who transcribes what the other person says. So you can listen to it as well as read it on the phone. Uh, and the transcriptionists I've watched, they, they are really remarkable. Uh, so it, it's something to think about either, whether it's for yourself or for a relative or someone who's a parent who has difficulty contacting their healthcare practitioners or can't communicate with you anymore long distance because they can't hear on the phone. These are things that can be really, really useful. And more and more, we're also getting voice to text apps. You can download um, a number of different apps. Uh, there's things like Otter, Live Transcribe. Um, I'm not trying to sell any of these for sure, but the, the, the issue is these can be very helpful. Uh, they're on your cell phone and you can, you know, when you want to use something uh, that you can use your cell phone and it will take the voice of the person talking and transcribe it. They're getting more and more accurate. And it's amazing to me how fast they can occur too. So you basically listen to the person, but you read whatever they're saying on the cell phone. Um, they can be helpful in noisy situations uh, or all, all kinds of situations where you have. And there are more and more coming into those places. We've had trouble in the clinical setting because of uh, what we call HIPAA regulations, privacy regulations. So there's only certain ones that can work in the clinical setting. But if it's just general conversation or uh, working with other people outside the, the hospital and or you know maybe your partners in the hospital and talking to them directly, they can use these things because it's not sensitive information. And I say sensitive, it's partly because the companies, they, they, it tends to go into a cloud or whatever. And of course the hospitals are worried about loss of that information. But many of the companies that are making these voice to text need the information from the standpoint of improving their voice to text um, products. Um, so you can understand their need for wanting to see the conversation, but not necessarily want to know what it is, but still hospitals or other kinds of clinic settings can be very worried about the, the loss of privacy. <clears throat> um, there's CART, of course, which is a wonderful system in terms of assisted real-time translation. It describes all the audio live, usually on site. It can help, well, it can help people with hearing aids or, or significant loss as well. So that can be very useful. Um, and then there's T coils. I'm just going to mention this for, especially for persons who have hearing aids, because this is not always raised for, by audiologists. And the T coil is basically a tiny little wire that is either in um, a neck loop or something that's like, as I said, the uh, personal amplifier, if it has a T coil. And then when you put it on, you have a setting like what they call an induction loop. And an induction loop is basically another wire that goes around a room, around a chair. You can almost loop anything. They used a lot in places like churches or high or other houses of worship where there's high ceilings or bad acoustics. Um, but the wire that's in the room, and the, these can be on the floor or different parts of the, the room. It'd be wonderful if they were embedded in architecture at this point. Um, and then there's a microphone and the sound from the microphone goes directly into the, um, this wire. And then if you have a T-coil in your hearing aid or have an adapter that uses the T-coil and you put your hearing aid on the T-coil setting, it goes directly to your hearing aid. And since your hearing aid is designed to fit your hearing loss, these can be very effective. Um, if you actually want to hear an example of them, you can go online and sort of say an example of a, a loop system or induction loop system and it will bring up at least uh, in most cases, you get to the one that a colleague of ours on the Hearing Loss Association 
uh, Richard Einhorn made of the subway system in New York and shows you with and without the use of a telecoil. So um, it's helpful to ask your audiologist about one of these. Whenever you see in a setting this little ear with the T, that means there's a T coil in there. Um, they're now using them more. They're trying to loop uh, um, airports and other there. New York has looped some taxi cabs. Uh, so you can loop almost anything. Europe uses this more than we do. But um, many people who have hearing aids don't even realize that it could come with this. This is basically what it might look like in terms of a wire, the little loop, and then it goes directly to the little hearing aid. Now, it is true that when you have, turn on your T-coil on the hearing aid, uh, it blocks off the microphone version. So sometimes people will keep one hearing aid on the T-coil and the other on microphone so they get background or hear on the other ear, depending on their system. But um, these can be very, very effective for individuals and at least want people to know because we, um, HLA has been, uh, has a major campaign that's been going on for, um, you know, join the loop, uh, loop the world or whatever. I'm blocking on the exact name, but the, to, to sort of increase our use of, of looping uh, around all settings for sure uh, to help people hear better in, in open settings or in churches or in uh, conferences. The um, Northern California uh, chapter has been trying to get them to be used or captioning or different things in their various meetings because um, it's not a hard to loop a thing, uh, loop a room. Um, uh, this, this is uh, turning now and I, We'll come back. I'm sure there may be questions around that. Of, and I hope I can answer some more of those. But the, when you think about communication though, it really involves effective strategies that involves our willingness to sort of invest some, um, you know, some effort into the effective communication. This can be true of any conversation. It doesn't necessarily just have to be people with difficulty hearing. But the underpinning of effective communication is, what is the awareness of the impact of hearing loss? Uh, sound simulations that you can sometimes get online on the internet may help. So people who don't have hearing loss can understand what distortion happens when people do get hearing loss. Uh, that you, know, you emphasize the individuals that hearing loss is not a decrease in sound, but it's usually a distortion. So the key frequencies are lost and it's why misunderstandings can happen. Um, appreciate that hearing aids and cochlear implants do not solve the problem. They don't correct the loss. They do not correct the underlying problem. They amplify key frequencies. So hearing is less effortfulness. Even the cochlear implants, which many people swear by um, because of the level of their loss that their hair cells were too damaged to be used effectively, um, it, it's, not a, it's not a complete fix for sure. Um, acknowledge the various surrounding factors that can influence your ability to hear, such as fatigue or um, just the effort that you're going into or the importance of it or your own level of concern about hearing. Emphasize the desire to communicate and when you may be too tired to, to listen. It is helpful to at least as the underpinning of trying to get effective communication. Um, and there are tips to hear better. Stand so the person speaking has the light on their face and is not in front of a window or a shadow because if, and this is true, I even see this on Zoom meetings when the person sits with a, with a window behind them and the light comes in, it washes out their face so you can't read their lips. If you're in a setting where you have the opportunity, ask for a quiet area. This would be true in a clinic setting or other area. Uh, at a reception, maybe find a quiet corner. If you go into a restaurant, sit in a quiet corner with your back to the wall so that you're hearing things from the front and not getting as much background noise. Let people know you have difficulty hearing so that they will, um, whether it's the friends, healthcare providers, receptions, everyone, so you can tell them that I hear better when I can see your face or when you look at me. Um, read lips, we do that automatically. Uh, now it's more difficult with masks, obviously, because you're not seeing lips and you're not seeing expressions as well. But it's amazing how much we do read lips and seeing someone's facial expressions 
and the movement of their lips can make a difference. Consider the context. Of course, try to be listed when, when hearing is especially important and ask for things to be in writing when you wanna know that. Maybe it's a meeting, like you're supposed to go see the dentist or whatever. Somebody's telling you that, have them write it down in case you didn't quite catch it. Use assistive listening devices. Um, and then for people who can help us hear, it's really important to try and realize we have to face the person with a hearing loss and make sure the lighting is adequate, uh, especially on our faces so that they can see us. Don't cover your mouth when talking. Speak at a normal rate and don't shout because shouting really doesn't help. It's not gonna fix the frequencies. Even if you raise your voice a little bit, shouting also changes the tone of our voice so people can get into arguments over the tone when people keep raising their voices over and over again. Maybe lower your pitch slightly if you're, especially this would be true more women than men, um, trying to get it in a, a, a less high frequency area. Um, but unless you have a low frequency voice or a deep voice, if you, they're asked to repeat, rephrase with a different word may help. Um, so you may say the same thing once, but then rephrase. Uh, and this again, you're using different words, different frequencies, the brain can fill in, especially if they know the context. Avoid critical conversations when you're both tired and write down information when it's important. Um, these F, these uh, communication strategies can take effort on both parts because we have to keep remembering. And I know most of us um, forget sometimes and will yell from a separate room or call down when you're, you know, suddenly think of, oh, I forgot to say this and yell it out. Uh, and it, it's for both of us. I mean, in terms of both directions, thinking carefully about, especially if it's going to be a critical conversation, that you sit in a, a, a room that may be quiet, that you face each other um, and talk about strategies that would work. But we have to be a little sympathetic with each other, I think, in terms of understanding that sometimes we will forget. Uh, and that's important to consider so we don't get too frustrated um, if we wanna be effective in communicating. Meg, um, I think um, we probably should get to a few questions because we're al almost out of time. Did you have anything uh, looks yeah, like this is the important. yeah. This is actually the last sure. slide. Sure, go ahead. Um, but I just want to remind you that if you get hearing aids, they should be comfortable, but they're not like glasses. They, you can't put them on and suddenly hear. Our brains have to relearn how to listen. It takes time to adapt. Wearing them is important. You usually have to return several times to maximize the benefit and get them tuned to your hearing loss. They don't work well in situations with poor acoustics and you have to have realistic expectations and so does the family. Make sure all your questions are answered. There are some hearing um, aid uh, purchasing guidelines available and use assistive listening devices and check if the hearing aid has a telecoil. Um, so that's the end. And I thank you for your patience and listening to almost two hours of me talk. It was wonderful, Meg, and we, there were so many questions. Given time, I've narrowed it down to three, and I'm sorry we can't get to all of them, but um, you're such a valuable resource. Everyone's trying <laughs> to get them in. Oh, um, I, okay. I, I wish I could answer them all. <laughs> Even better, I know there's a lot of things that um, I'm not as, you know, I can stop yeah. sharing this. Perfect, Thank okay. Um, so one from Alice, she says, when should you get new hearing aids? If a new pair is allowed every three years by your insurance, does that imply that they wear out or decrease effectiveness over time? No, I, I, it really will depend on uh, how you think that they're functioning. Um, I think it's just like glasses. I mean, they'll give you a new set of glasses after a certain number of years, but buying a new set's not necessarily needed if the glasses you have or if your vision hasn't changed. I think maybe getting an assessment, but it's also sort of monitoring your own hearing um, in terms of seeing whether you're having more difficulty in certain settings. There are some times when you think you read and you see some new programs or new settings where you might benefit from a new kind of hearing aid and so forth, um, but you should be getting reevaluated in terms of hearing loss at certain intervals anyway, hopefully according to your plan. So I would judge it more on 
the functionality of the hearing aid than mandating that you're going to go back and get a new one. Right. Um, to that point, I'm combining two questions. So one is from Chandra, who said, will you recommend the best places to go to get hearing aids? People are talking about Costco or Kaiser. And then Wendy says, do you have any recommendations for a fitting during COVID? Um, I don't like to advertise specific places. I, I will say that uh, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from persons who go to Costco and that it is a, a lower cost source of hearing aids. Um, there's also in the city, um, the Hearing and Speech Center of California, Northern California, it's a nonprofit. They deal with persons across the lifespan. Um, and I, I know their philosophy is very good. Um, and, um, but in general, I mean, I, I can't name a, audiologist that I would just necessarily recommend. I just think in, that when one goes to an audiologist, you really need to ask questions and make sure that you're getting all your questions answered. That's right. That was one of the last questions is how do I determine who is the most qualified audiologist in the Bay Area? Are there different levels of training or certification? Oh, actually, th there are there. I mean, you, you can, there are persons who are hearing aid dispensers in a way who, who, who are very focused on that's all they do. Audiologists now all have what they call a doctor of audiology. So in other words, it's, it's not a PH, a clinical doctorate, but that's the entry level of practice of audiologists. So they are qualified to do more than the, um, those who are just dispensers. The dispensers really need to make sure that they refer if they have any kind, they do know red flags, they should know red flags. Um, but yes, you should watch for the qualifications to um, know what they're getting. Uh, and, and as I say, there's, there is this uh, hearing tracker uh, group you know, that, that's online that allows you to look at who's close to you and what they've checked um, I don't think they go in and vet them. But the other thing is when you ask the, when you ask the audiologist that you go, that you go to, one is they say, ask, ask all the questions about what you're getting for your services, but make sure that they're doing things like measuring the hearing with the aid uh, directly so that they're, and they're doing the range of testing of your hearing loss. So it's not just a pure tone average or something that you're getting assessed for word recognition and speech and noise or words and noise or other kinds of assessments to get the best evaluation and also tell them what you want. And they're almost all of them have a return policy. So if you really think that you're not getting what you wish or someone's really pushing you to buy a certain kind of hearing aid, you, know, you may wanna shop around. I mean, it's, it's, it's your right to certainly shop around and get more than one opinion if you're at all concerned. Wonderful. Well, I wanted to share there were so many comments of appreciation and how informative this presentation was. So we're so grateful for your time today. And I'm going to pass it to Roberta to close us out. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much for this outstanding presentation. I know you've convinced me to get a hearing test and you've made an important contribution to our education on this subject. And I hope we can have you back at a later date to answer some more of these questions that we didn't get to. Uh, before we leave today, I have a couple of items I wanna to bring to um, your attention at the village. One is about our hearing loss support group. Uh, as some of you may know, our hearing loss support group has been suspended since we've gone virtual due to the pandemic. But now that we have closed caption capacity on Zoom, we're hoping to explore the possibility of restarting this group sometime in the spring. And we're currently looking for a facilitator for this group. So do email Suyan Beckner or myself at Ashby Village if you know of anyone you'd like to recommend. Secondly, please do watch for our spring Embracing Change lecture in April on managing chronic pain. Our Speaker will be from Kaiser Permanente as part of our new collaboration with them and have a lovely rest of the day. And again, thank you so much 
Dr. Walhagen for this wonderful presentation. Bye now. Bye. And if you have some of those questions from chat that I couldn't see, you can always let me know and I can see if I can answer anything. Thanks so much. And thank you for having me and for everybody's attention and willingness to listen for a long time. Thanks. Take care.